Hello and welcome to this installment of educational webcast focused on power generation, how to plan and budget for facility energy projects. Uh, for today's webinar, we have over 100 years of energy business experience between our presenters and our behind the scenes team working to support the event. Uh, our presenters today include Ray Marcel, who leads Caterpillar's efforts in supporting the engineering consultant community in North America. He'll be presenting on our emergency power systems uh, segment today. Joe Fiorito is our product and market development manager for Caterpillar's rental power business in North America. He'll be presenting on temporary energy services. While Mike Devine has global gas product and market development responsibilities, and we'll be covering the portion of today outlining combined heat and power and financing. I'm your moderator, Nick Kelch, with Caterpillar Electric Power, um, working behind the scenes today with Tim Scott to, to facilitate this webinar. Um, we're here to help answer topical questions that you may have during the webcast. And uh, in a moment, we'll get started. But before I do, a couple housekeeping issues. Um, we do have our technical support, Shanicia standing behind the scenes as well to help with any technical webinar or console issues that you might have. This will be a 50-minute presentation followed by 10 minutes of live questions and answers at the end um, of the presentation time. Uh, I'll be selecting some of your questions to read aloud and pose live to our speakers at the end. We hope that you stay through that uh, session. Uh, we will be following up with an email uh, in the next day or two after the live event, uh, notifying you that this uh, webcast will be available as a recorded event that you can come back and view, well, as many times as you'd like, really, um, after the call. And uh, the, the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the webcast console itself. Uh, please do notice that you have several applications here most notably the Q&A icon. Uh, you may submit your questions live to us uh, throughout the event. We'll answer you textually uh, via that Q&A chat feature during the course of the presentation if we can. Uh, in the case that we're unable to answer your question, uh, we'll be sure to follow up after the event with you via email. You may need to click that refresh button on your Q&A box to view our response. Uh, the webcast console also includes some other links for you to our online community, our news page, CAT website, uh, and YouTube page as well. The green literature icon does have some case studies that we reference uh, in this presentation, as well as a white paper on the subject of combined heat and power for your uh, downloading convenience here. Uh, the recorded webcast will be available for the next few months after the event. Uh, we are issuing continuing education units for those that requested them at registration for the event and who attend the full live event. Uh, those CEU credits will arrive in your inbox via email directly from Bradley University, so we appreciate your patience. Um, and before I really start to get into the meat of the presentation, um, I do want to quickly do a couple poll questions. So you can get to know each other as an audience. And if you could, please uh, click the radio button and submit your answer to this first question. Uh, what industry do you work in? Manufacturing, industrial, services, or commercial facilities, governmental or municipal, uh, engineering or consulting, uh, community, utility energy services, or some other industry. If you could, please uh, go ahead and submit your answers, and I'll go ahead and share the results with you. Uh, now, so it looks like we have a pretty good mix of different different industries and different interests. A lot of our uh, consulting engineers and, and engineering community seems to be with us today, which is great. Uh, we think our content here will, will serve you well. And then uh, one more question, and then we'll introduce our first speaker. What areas of facility energy are you most interested in? In emergency systems, in uh, temporary or rental systems, um, combined heat and cooling, uh, combined heat and power and cooling, or any and all of the above. If you could please go ahead and uh, submit your answer to this question as well, and I'll share the results. Um, it looks like um, a good mix of interest here. Uh, we have quite a few people that are interested in, well, all of the above, which is great because that's what we're going to present on. So 
Um, well, without further ado, uh, what I'd like to do is hand off the presentation to our next speaker, Ray Marcel. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of time here and walk everyone through a high-level overview of what most people think of when they think of backup power, uh, and that's emergency standby power or diesel uh, generation. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the electrical system components uh, and how that plays in a decision in terms of the cost for your infrastructure. Uh, but first, I want to start by explaining why uh, diesel tends to be the predominant fuel of choice when looking at an emergency power system. And, and predominantly, it's, it's two reasons. One is the low initial installed cost versus a gas-powered or even a turbine-powered type system. And, and secondly is the initial transient and block loading capability or starting capability. As you'll see in the chart on the bottom, um, the, the yellow curve represents where the diesel tends to play. And for many of our customers, a low hour uh, immediate need for power is the predominant driver. Now my colleague, Mr. Devine, will be talking here shortly as it relates to the gas product, which you can see has much better uh, cost efficiencies and higher hour and higher efficiency type usages. But I think the main driver and main thing that we would want any customer that we work with to understand is help us understand your application. And that will probably come up as we go through the presentation multiple times today. Now, I mentioned uh, the install cost versus diesel and gas. Uh, and, and these are just some examples that, that we can use for illustration. Now, the basic generator set cost on a dollar per kW basis, that can vary depending upon the model and vendor that you choose and the size of the product itself. But I think more importantly than the specific costs on here is the understanding of what it takes uh, to get a backup power system uh, installed and on site. Uh, and as you look at the mechanical and structural type of, of piece of this uh, equation, uh, you're talking about whether the unit's going into a building, an engine room, or in an enclosure uh, outside. Uh, the electrical component is certainly one that can vary greatly. Now, whether that's a simple transfer switch or on the high end, uh, very complex paralleling switch gear and controls, as well as UPSs or uninterrupted power supply. Uh, startup commissioning, labor, freight, all of those things come into play. But the main purpose and the main uh, thing that we want you to take away from this, and we talk internally many times about, we are really about half of the total equation. Um, and there's a variety of other products we'll talk about here that are beyond the core gen set itself. Now I spent a little bit of time uh, explaining to you how diesel is a lower installed cost than gas. Now I'm going to back up and not to dive into the emissions regulation uh, aspect of things too much, but in today's regulatory environment there are certain costs being added uh, depending upon once again what your specific application is. Uh, so for example, the EPA uh, here in North America has uh, Tier 4 guidelines. Now those follow uh, and apply for non-emergency type applications. Uh, so essentially, if aside from maintenance, you have an application where you're going to be required to run when utility power is available, Tier 4 may apply to you. The reason I mention this is just to make sure that everyone understands that the after treatment and emissions reductions uh, devices that are going to go onto that product uh, can get it very much in line with what we see from an installed cost basis with gas. Uh, so it can kind of throw that initial installed cost out the window and really have you just evaluate what your long-term operational and application requirements are. Uh, not to jump once again too far down uh, the path of talking about emissions, but for those of you that have products on site, uh, there are also uh, NESHAP regulations. Uh, and that stands for the National Emission Standard for Hazardous Air Pollutants. And this is a retrofit type regulation. So from a cost standpoint, just making sure that there's awareness in the industry that once again, if you operate in a quote unquote non-emergency type mode, uh, then you may want to talk with your vendor, you may want to talk with an emissions consultant uh, and see based upon the age of the product that you have installed, whether or not uh, these oxidation catalysts or other uh, after treatment devices are going to be required for your site. Next, I want to dive a little bit into some of the electrical aspects or the other components within the system design besides the genset itself. 
Uh, I spent a bit of time talking and comparing the gas and diesel genset products. And I'm going to dive into the different UPS products that are out in the marketplace. Uh, and, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on these except to point out that much like the diesel had initial performance benefits versus gas, uh, the flywheel UPS has many uh, performance characteristic benefits uh, over what most of the market sees and uses in the battery or double conversion product. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. But from a cost standpoint, uh, while the flywheel has some of those performance benefits, uh, the battery certainly has an initial installed cost benefit. Same uh, example as what I talked through previously on the genset side of things, that uh, the, the components themselves are only a piece of the entire puzzle. Uh, but, but battery certainly has that lower installed cost, but flywheel has a long-term owning and operating benefit. So as you're looking at uh, comparing versus a battery system, once you get to year three or year four and your batteries require that replacement, with the flywheel product, you don't need that uh, battery you do. And that can average over the years to be a pretty substantial dollar amount. Now, I've talked quite a bit about uh, what, uh, the benefits of flywheel, uh, but many folks um, don't understand that. But they also uh, understand when they talk about flywheel, the one bit downside to the product itself, and that is the ride-through time. We tend to say uh, internally that uh, if you don't have a gen set up and online in 10 seconds, you probably won't have that gen set up and online in 10 minutes. So the, the matter of seconds of ride through with a flywheel product uh, is, is relatively insignificant. Now, I, I say that, but we also understand that in a scheme like what you see on the screen today uh, with a large paralleling system, you're adding time for generators to get up and online and parallel together. Uh, and so that can certainly play a role in your decision on what product you're comfortable going with, especially as you talk about a highly reliable system design. So when we see the flywheel product deployed, we tend to see it in what I'll call a distributed type system design, and that is almost a one-to-one -one match uh, with the generator set and the flywheel system downstream. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of details as it relates to system design itself, but my point in mentioning these different design criteria is to point out the different types of costs that one can occur. And it's really that cost versus reliability relationship and equation that every end user needs to take into account when they're determining what their needs and what their application really is. As it relates to uh, lower cost and improved reliability, uh, one thing that is not you know, vendor specific, uh, but a generator set start module. Uh, for those of you in the industry, you're probably aware that generator starting batteries tend to be one of the weakest links in the entire system, whether that be because of maintenance or just batteries in general. Uh, the Genset Start Module is a relatively low-cost item uh, that pulls a small amount of power from a UPS system uh, and can provide that uh, redundant 24 volts of starting uh, power to a generator set system. Now I'm going to track back and, and talk a little bit about power density. Uh, many of the vendors in the industry are really striving to improve power density, and it's not necessarily about uh, getting, in this example that you see on the screen, 4 megawatts out of a single package. It's about moving that 4 megawatts from a low speed to a high speed type offering. So in Caterpillar's instances, you see the two products that we can offer at that power rating. Um, and the reason it's important is when you look at your traditional uh, low speed, and, and when I say low speed, I'm talking 900 RPM, uh, it tends to have many of the characteristics and performance characteristics that I, that I mentioned earlier with the gas product. Uh, now, there's certainly variation in that, but as you talk about the, the 3612, for example, it does not have anywhere near uh, the starting capability, load acceptance capability that the newer products do today in the marketplace, such as the C17520 that you see here. Now, while that's important uh, from a performance characteristic, it also translates back into a desire to reduce total cost uh, to the end user. Now, that could be uh, in a hospital application, a large hospital application, where a significant number of units are going to be required. Uh, you can cut down the number of units, but also by cutting down the number of units, you can cut down a total installed cost, whether that be an additional breaker in your paralleling switchgear. Uh, whether that be long-term owning and operating or maintenance costs on one less unit. Uh, also, at the electrical contractor side, uh, there could be cost savings in terms of the number of pads poured, 
uh, or the, the less conduit being run within the system itself. Now the last thing I want to talk about before I, I turn it over to my colleague on the rental power side is uh, back to regulations and more specifically codes and regulations. While it's important to understand your application from an emission standpoint, uh, it's also important to make sure you understand your application from a code standpoint. Uh, and here's just one example is for those of you who live in the healthcare world, um, NFPA 110, the, the 2013 edition, uh, there is a change coming out and it states that essentially whenever the emergency generator is not in service, uh, an alternate source of power shall be supplied. So once again, from the standpoint of evaluating the cost of your system, if you don't have redundancy built into that system and you take a unit down, let's say, just for standard maintenance, the NFPA regulations now state uh, that you have to have a temporary source of power. Uh, so a rental unit or, or what have you would be appropriate. And once again, much like the Genset Start, another relatively low-cost item to think about uh, when you think about design, both in terms of reliability and cost, but something like a Quick Connect uh, to have the Camlock cabling or Quick Connect cabling uh, able to be accessed on the exterior of a building uh, can certainly provide advantages to an end user, uh, whether it be for one of those maintenance type of, of requirements that I just mentioned or in a true outage uh, in terms of being able to run the cabling uh, into the building, almost a plug and play type device, versus having to run the cabling through a basement and across stairs and all those other types of good things that some of us have all uh, experienced in the past. So with that, that's the end of my session. I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleague, Mr. Joe Fiorito. Uh, Joe is our rental power business manager. Thanks, Ray. When, uh, when referring to temporary energy services, we're basically discussing what solutions are available to assist in the event of an outage. Now, I realize looking at the audience preview that only 2.7% of you were really interested in temporary solutions. I'm really hoping that the all, all of the above uh, actually have some interest in this topic as well. Basically, in terms of outages, you know, these can either be planned circumstances for maintenance, repair, or replacements of critical items such as switchgear, transformers, uh, utility tie-in, or perhaps you're working on your HVAC system, HVAC system where you're looking at you know, your chiller, your heater, air handlers, air conditioners, or perhaps even your backup generator. Hopefully these are events that you have time to plan for and don't cause a great deal of grief. However, we all know that equipment doesn't exactly follow its prescribed life expectancy and things do go bump in the night. So if a storm or an accident takes down a critical system, rest assured that there are temporary solutions available that will restore your business continuity. And this part of the presentation will focus on just a few examples of temporary energy solutions. And for simplicity and time, I'm only gonna focus on two types of utilities that seem to have the highest impact on the majority of facilities that we face. Uh, these being electricity and the HVAC if you are interested in compressed air solutions, uh, these can be discussed at a later time. Generally speaking, loss of electricity can be the single most disruptive situation in a facility, and yet it's something that we all take granted for. In today's digital society, seconds seem like hours, and hours seem like an eternity. You know, Ray mentioned about the you know, generator starting up in 10 seconds or less. Uh, I can assure you when the lights are down and you're looking for that generator to start up, it, uh, it seems like you're watching a calendar at that time. So if you find yourself planning uh, or executing stages of trying to find temporary power, here's a few guidelines that you want to consider. First of all, mobile generator sets come in all types of sizes. I'm gonna skip over the real small ones like the ones you pick up at Home Depot or your big box store and start with like a, your small towable generator set, uh, something like a 20 kilowatt as shown in the lower left-hand corner there. Uh, these are most popular for providing power to your smaller locations where loads are less than about 30 amps at 40 volt or typical single phase applications. You know, the portable generator sets, you know, they start at about 20, but they go all the way as high as 2,000 kilowatts with many, many nodes in between. And for loads greater than 2,000 kilowatts, uh, larger generator sets can be paralleled to basically provide virtually unlimited kilowatts, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner, where there's an installation there with over 100 Caterpillar XQ2000 generator sets providing power for a utility. And for loads somewhere in between, such as the oil platform picture in the middle, 
Uh, it's pretty simple to couple up a couple of generator sets, uh, feed a step-up transformer, and easily get the job done. Most generators in the market today uh, do operate at multiple voltages, anywhere from your 12208 up to 277480, and of course, through the use of transformers, just about every application can be accounted for. So when sourcing a, a temporary generator, there are a few areas that you really need to focus on. First off, what is the voltage you would like to connect at? And you need to determine first if you'll be connecting to a piece of switch gear, a quick connect box that Ray mentioned and shown earlier, or a specific piece of equipment that needs the power or a transformer. A good electrical contractor can usually assist you with some of those recommendations. After you've figured out what voltage you will need, the next is how many amps you're going to need or what load it will be required. This can be determined by looking at the breaker size and or operating data. Actually, operating data is your best source of information. You know, we'll often get a call to provide a backup generator set for an emergency, and the customer doesn't exactly know the real load on his system, so he takes a look at the main breaker and you know, we, we size the generator accordingly. I want to point out that there is usually a very large margin between a customer's 3,000 3, amp main panel rating versus what we actually put there when we do the installation. And often is the case, you know, our generators get out there and they can be oversized, which actually can be an issue. You know, when you're operating a diesel engine, um, more is not always a good thing. Diesel engines like to work hard and uh, they can get pretty messy if they're underloaded. So again, if you have actual data, that's the best opportunity for us. Another thing to consider is that most facilities were not built to provide easy access such as tie-ins. So when you need powering up, the next thing to look at is where you're actually going to park that generator and how you're actually going to route the cables. Uh, and Ray's example of the quick disconnect box and external installation is, is the best. Uh, however, breaching walls, going down stairwells is pretty common practice. So a couple key points to review is, you know, once or, what, make sure that the generator is easily accessible for servicing. This includes leaving room for fuel trucks, service trucks, and technicians. You know, most of our generators are shipped with just a limited amount of fuel on board just to get you through the initial startup or a certain period of time. And this is primarily to cut down on weight. Uh, technicians and electricians will be need clear access to provide you know, connections for the cables and to route them to your connection point. You will also need to be aware of noise and building air intakes. Uh, mobile generators are designed to operate at low noise and emissions, but this can be relative to certain circumstances. It's not a good idea to put a gen set anywhere near an open window or an intake duct. It's a much better idea to move the generator further away and increase the length of the cable. Most rental companies stock sufficient lengths of cable to place the generator a safe distance away, and these cables are usually like 50-foot lengths with quick disconnect couplers to make them very easy for installation. The last consideration would be the duration of the project. This is not, it's not um, so much on the extended run times, but you know, diesel engines get quite thirsty and need servicing at certain intervals. A good rule of thumb is that diesel generator will consume about 70 gallons of diesel fuel per megawatt hour. Larger generators operate a little bit better and little ones a little bit worse. So in the case of a 2,000 kilowatt generator operating at about 80% load, don't be surprised to be burning over 100 gallons an hour. And with only 1,250 gallons on board, you may need a fuel plan if you're planning on running for an extended period of time. So I put together a chart for your reference, and these are just some ballpark numbers to provide you with a general understanding of what goes into a temporary power project. There are a lot of variables in a temporary power business, so before you commit to a firm price, please commit, contact your local CAT dealer to get a better number. First off, how big is a project? Is it a difficult or super sensitive solution? Are there specific emissions requirements or permitting needs? Will the gener generators be standing by? in the case of an outage, or will they be running for many hours? When referring to temporary solutions, we're really just talking about rental opportunities for rental houses. And with all rental businesses, it's about acquisition price and utilization. As we all know, prices have been going up every year since the dawn of time, and most recently with the newest and tightest emission reg emissions regulations, uh, we've seen prices increase from 30 to 50% in a very short period of time. 
So there can be a very big difference in renting a generator that was built in 1999 with virtually no emissions controls to one that's built today with state-of-the-art controls that are actually take this generator set and let it operate 90% environmentally cleaner. So generally speaking, the rental industry has standardized rental rates as daily, weekly, and monthly, where three days equals a week and three weeks equals a month. Uh, single shift operations refer to an asset that runs for about eight hours a day or less. Double shift will take you between eight and 16 hours a day, and unlimited or triple shift is anything beyond your 16 hours a day. And uh, when you operate double shift, you're actually going to take your rental rate and multiply it by 1.5. Unlimited, you actually take your daily rate and double it. As an example, if you have an item that rents for $100 a day, that would be $300 a week and $900 a month for single shift. And again, multiply it by 1.5, so that $300 a week would be $450 a week if you ran it double time or $600 a week if you ran it uh, unlimited time. So all of the examples in this chart here assume just a few things. Uh, a standard charge-out rate for cable is about $1.50 a foot. Uh, you have to keep in mind that we have multiple leads per phase, depending on the size of the generator set. And we're also using $4 a gallon for diesel price and 160 hours at full load running prime. Um, so let's take a look at a couple of charts to give you a better understanding on renting generators that show the impact on diesel versus gas. So recently, natural gas has been introduced as a temporary power solution. Obviously, this is not uh, for everyone, but here's a comparison to show the difference in rental rates for diesel versus natural gas mobile generators operating in a single shift operation. Obviously, there's a big disparity when comparing the two on a price per kilowatt basis, but the one thing you have to keep in mind is that these natural gas engines were built on the same platform as their diesel counterparts. As an example, a 3500 a Caterpillar 3500 class gen set with 16 cylinders can produce 2,500 kilowatts of power. Compare that to the same size 16-cylinder 16, 16 engine would be about 1,000 kilowatts less. And this is primarily due to the energy content available within the fuel and the spark ignition characteristics. Now, before you decide which is your best solution, you have to keep in mind other important factors like how often the engine will be running, emissions regulations, in the next chart here, you'll see that um, there's a, uh, a big difference when you look at when you add up your fuel versus your rental costs. So we saw in the first slide that obviously the rental cost for natural gas was a lot more. But in this chart here, you can see that uh, depending on your operating hours, the natural gas solution actually turns out to be a more economical solution. And the crossover point here is right around 150, 160 hours assuming $4 for diesel fuel and $5 per million BTU for natural gas. So if you do have an application that's going to run more than 150, 200 hours, clearly natural gas is a solution you want to be looking for. And if you're not uh, interested in power and you're really looking more in the temperature control space, um, very similar to the you know, power systems component, uh, temporary solutions exist for temperature control as well. So first thing is, when's the last time you did an energy audit to see how your, your equipment is performing? Do you have a lot of redundancy built into your systems? Is that uh, anything new coming on in the marketplace in terms of impact to your zone? Uh, a good example we saw this year during the NHL season, you know, the NHL uh, league is playing much later in the year, which is uh, playing quite havoc with these uh, facilities that were designed and built quite some time ago and not designed to run into the late months where it's now 80, 90 degrees outside. So take a look at your systems. Another thing you want to look at is interconnectability. You know, it's pretty easy to splice into some ductwork to provide some uh, comfort cooling or heating, but in terms of chilled water, do you actually have flanges or valves that allow easy access for another piece of equipment to be added into the system? So again, something to take a look at. And just like rental, you know, it's, it's, it's an asset-based business, so you need to uh, take a look at the duration of the project and uh, how many hours a day you plan on running it. Uh, the last slide here just gives you some basic pricing. Um, we have, uh, you know, when you look at heaters, you know, very simple. I really rec recommend you talking with our dealers to find out the exact solution because just in the heaters alone, we have three different options. We have direct, indirect heat, and flameless heater depending on your environment. 
you know, some are explosive conditions, some have breathable air, some do not have breathable air. And um, hopefully this is giving you a pretty good understanding of, you know, temporary solutions and the economics behind them. Uh, we're going to shift gears here a little bit and turn it over to Mike Devine to get you some more complex solutions. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, would like to spend just a couple of minutes now talking about the concepts of combined heat and power and some of the reasons why the combined heat and power aspects work in the marketplace today, particularly as we're starting to see it in North America coming along quite well, and why it works financially. The other thing is we'd like to discuss a little bit about uh, financing projects in general. So whether it be a diesel or a gas project, I uh, would like to be able to uh, share with you a little bit about that. If we're talking about combined heat and power, as most know, it's uh, basically defined as the simultaneous and sequential use of power and heat from the same source. And that is the same fuel source. So what we're trying to do is make sure that you have the power to be able to power the generator itself, but at the same time that you also are able to use the uh, heat that has been generated from that combustion process for some other useful purpose. And whether it be uh, hot water or uh, hot air, uh, whether it be cold water, all of those things can be achieved by using uh, this type of device. What is really driving this market and what has been driving it for years or not driving it, as the case may be, has been basically the spark spread or the difference between the price of energy, uh, electric energy, and an energy created from a gas source. So as you can see, the red line over time has been um, in the early, in the 90s and early 2000s was uh, certainly beneficial to be using the gas. The gas prices were quite a bit cheaper. Uh, during the late 2000s, um, the gas prices rose quite a bit. The electricity, though it did rise, was not rising as fast, and so it was not as cost effective to be using that. With the advent of the uh, shale gases and the uh, lower cost natural gases that we're seeing, and the foreseeable future shows the price spread to remain positive for this. That has uh, grown quite a bit, and we're seeing a lot of interest now in these combined heat and power systems, something that is going to be very valuable, I think, in the long term for all of our projects. So what's really driving all of this into the marketplace? Emission regulations is one of the big ones. And if we see in many of these applications, it's not just the national uh, emission regulations, but also many local regulations are getting in, in the way of being able to uh, apply these, these projects. Um, local incentives, both tax incentives, whether they be federal or local, uh, direct incentives from local or, or sources, and also the national and regional sourcing for income. Uh, the cogen efficiency is a big deal in that you're going from resource efficiencies of uh, somewhere between 38 and 45 percent electrical efficiency of a basic generator set. Being able to use the heat from that engine, you can see efficiencies upwards of 90 percent total efficiencies. Uh, grid reliability is a big issue, and as the coal-fired plants seem to have more pressure to, uh, to leave the system, uh, what we see is that the reliability will be even challenged more. And so many industries particularly are going to be very interested in trying to come up with the right kinds of products to be able to maintain proper uh, voltage and control over their systems. And these um, cogeneration systems and distributed generation in general has the capability of doing that. Environmental pressures and the EPA and the regulations that are coming out today and will be coming out in our near future are certainly uh, pressuring a lot of areas to create lower emissions. Gaseous fueled engines have the capability of, of reaching quite low emission levels. And of course the natural gas infrastructure. If you do not have the gas available, it'd be obviously difficult to, to use and work with a gaseous fueled product. And whether you're talking about uh, the natural gas that's in a pipeline quality, whether it's a compressed natural gas or, or liquid natural gas, as we see in many different parts of the world today, or if we even talk about the propanes, the, the fuels that are takeoffs from the, the wet gases coming out of these shale fields today, a lot of fuel sources available for that liquid fuel today. So how do we use the heat off of the engine and what is, does it get used for? Well, we're traditionally used to seeing the electric power coming out of these generator sets, whether it be for distributed generation purposes, for utility peaking, all those, uh, any different type of project where you actually need the electric power. If I'm at the end of a grid and I don't, the grid does not have enough power to support 
the facility that you're either putting up or wanting to add on to or using today, uh, electric power generation has always been a, a good option for being able to fill in those needs. The use of hot water off of these engines can be a very useful thing, but keep in mind that the first priority of any co uh, cogeneration project is to cool the engine. If we don't take care of that need of the engine to keep the engine cool, it's just like in your automobile. If you plug up your radiator or you take your radiator out of the system, your car won't be running very long. And the same thing is true with these cogeneration systems. But once you've identified the right types of cooling systems to be able to do it, the hot water that is available out of your normal uh, radiator circuits can do a very good job of, of allowing you hot water for many different purposes. In many applications, we also see that hot air can be available to you. And it could be as simple as having a, a diverter, a piece of plywood that would go in front of a radiator system that would move air in and out of a building. Uh, we had a maintenance facility once where uh, we were up in a mining application, had a gas engine that was up operating uh, power for the main power for the facility. And during the winter months, they would move the flap over and uh, push the hot air into the building. During the summer months, when they didn't need all that heat, they just simply move the plywood main and uh, shoot the air outside as opposed to inside. So it, it can be very simple and doesn't have to be rocket science to be able to use that hot air and hot water effectively in these systems. We also have the capability of taking heat off of the exhaust systems, and that could be in the form of either hot water, uh, quite a bit of hot water, can create steam off of this. Uh, the lower pressure steams under 100 PSI is, uh, is quite simple to do there, though the steam processes do cost more than what a standard hot water system would. We also have the capability of taking chilled water off, using the hot water from these systems to go into an absorption chiller and to be able to create cold water for your facilities. So all of those are options for you with, with a combined heat and power system. There are applications, though, that can also use the CO2, which is a natural byproduct of the combustion process, and use the CO2 for something beneficial. So if I have a greenhouse, for example, that would want to use the, the CO2 to actually fertilize the plants that are being heated and lit by the generator set in that greenhouse, uh, something very easy to do and can create an additional growth of somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, uh, quite common. Uh, in those types of plants and applications, used very regularly in places in Europe. You can also use the CO2 for a bottling plant and to be able to use as carbonation and beverages or for other CO2 purposes. Uh, the, the CO2 is clean to the point where it is basically as safe as any other produced CO2 source might be. The applications that these go into are many. And many manufacturing, office buildings and facilities, uh, greenhouses, district heating plants, and facilities where we have a um, local source of heat for many different facilities. For drying purposes, brick kilns, wood processing facilities. Uh, desalinization is a popular use, particularly in the coastal areas where they have a need to desalinate the water. Uh, the heat from these systems can work very well in those applications. Uh, refineries and oil processing and of course, in the institutions, many of them uh, very similar in scope to the district heating type of plant where you can use the heat for uh, productive purposes. A typical system is uh, not a very difficult thing. And in fact, this is uh, kind of a view of what a two megawatt system might look like. In this case, you have two megawatts of electrical, another 2.2 megawatts of heat. And in production of CO2, you'd end up with about 870 kilograms per hour of the CO2 that would be available to you. The unit is really quite simple. The basic generator set sitting right there. The front module in the front of that unit is for jacket water heat recovery and uh, can be located either right in front of the unit or right adjacent to it, right above it, right below the unit. Doesn't really matter where as long as it's plumbed and piped in correctly. The third unit is the muffler and the heat recovery unit. Also inside of that heat recovery unit in this particular case is the, um, the cleaner and the recovery system for the CO2 if that is in fact something that would be useful to you. So we see that used in many different applications in many different styles. Very often times if your footprint on the floor is, is a challenge to you and you have vertical space, 
putting the muffler and heat recovery equipment above the engine is something that is quite commonly done. It could be put in parallel with it. It could be uh, put uh, right behind the generator set. Any different location would be fine. One just needs to be concerned about running the pipes and making sure that you have enough flow rate to be able to take care of your load and your application. So when does the CHP make sense? Anytime you've got a high electric and or thermal demand, um, a power generation system may be of use to you. For extended operating hours, when you're needing to have these systems operate for long periods of time, uh, the gaseous fuel products run and are designed to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And in fact, some of the systems today, many of the larger systems, are actually designed to run 4,000 hours between the times that you would stop them to change the oil and to look at the spark plugs on the engine. So effectively shutting the engines down twice a year for service and maintenance. Um, they are quite reliable, and when you need reliability in systems, uh, multiple units with multiple shafts can help provide the quality that you might need for your power generation needs. Also operating with reduced emissions, these engines are quite common in the one gram or half gram per brake horsepower hour range, but have the capabilities of going lower than that with um, uh, supplemental equipment to be able to lower the emissions even further. They have um, a capability of offsetting electric costs, and in many cases when you have um, either carbon tax issues uh, that you can use to beneficially use these products would, would qualify to, to offer those carbon taxes and can oftentimes take uh, the electricity cost down quite considerably uh, when you have high cross energy that's coming into your facility. Uh, the use of these electric uh, systems can be very positive in trying to keep those costs low for low operating costs on a facility. And of course, incentives for energy efficiency. If you're into a lead application, uh, these engines qualify for many of those applications and can assist you in your lead qualifications for these um, for facilities. The cost on systems vary widely, as we've talked about with the other types of products. But if you're looking at a basic price on a generator set, you look at the mechanical systems, they're very similar in the enclosures to what you would see on any of the diesel systems. Where you get into some of the other intricacies is some of the heat recovery equipment. Now in some places you can even use heat recovery on diesel engines, and if you were using it for enough hours, there's no reason why you couldn't use particularly the jack of water heat out of those systems. It could be very effective and it's done in many places around the world. In North America, we tend to see more gas engines being used for combined heat and power applications. The electrical systems on a diesel or a gas unit are very similar. You're paralleling with exactly the same type of equipment. The methods to parallel with the grid are very similar. Uh, meeting NFPA 110 restrictions is, is quite difficult because of the amount of time it takes to get the gas and air into the cylinders and to build the fire, if you will, in the cylinder to be able to pick up the load but they oftentimes are used in non-life safety standby applications and can be used in those applications as well. A commissioning freight and the logistics of getting units to site, again, very similar to what you would see in the diesel product areas. So if you're used to working with diesel products, uh, a lot of the same considerations for the application and installation of a gas engine that you would use in that diesel counterpart. Uh, as you can see, if you're just taking some hot water, taking some hot water and steam, Notice that when you start working with steam units, that the, the costs tend to start to jump pretty quickly. Some pretty qualified uh, pieces of equipment that are required, particularly for the higher pressure steam systems that you might have on, on tap. If we look at a combined heat and power system in a basic wa jacket water only heat recovery system with about 67% resource efficiency versus a normal uh, engine at about 40% resource efficiency, you can see that with excess operating hours that your cost of operation actually goes down and that the incremental cost of the combined heat and power certainly drives that cost down even more. So you can get more value because of the value of the heat that is being generated that you don't have to buy from another source. You've already bought the gas to use. Why not use the, uh, the hot water from that system? We can also see that a uh, huge impact on these payback periods is the utilization. So if I've got a system that's only going to be utilized 30 or 40% of the time, the payback periods 
could be quite a bit longer than if I'm being able to utilize it and generate revenue from it for more hours during a given year. So utilization is the one thing that you'll want to be paying attention to as you start to size these systems and start looking at the, the cost and the quality of the system. We also notice that the cost of systems tend to go down with larger units on a cost per kilowatt basis. So if I've got more kilowatts on site, I can expect to see um, some savings in my total cost per kilowatt of my installed cost. Shifting gears a little bit to the financial side of these situations, we see typically three different types of uh, systems that usually get done. A behind-the-fence system is usually a system that might be owned by a company, a parent company, where the corporate folks are going to be financing the system. So financial considerations would be more from a corporate financing perspective. Developers can be developing projects and have project financing just as well, too. But you'll have different considerations by the financial folks to uh, make that happen and, of course, municipal projects that can be in there as well. The financing can be of many different types and structured many different ways. By far the simplest is if you are borrowing on your corporate assets so that corporately or individually that you would pay back that system and basically promise to, to pay that system back to the financial company. You can, though, on the other end of that uh, system, go for a non-recourse project finance loan, which basically suggests that I'm going to finance the project on the merits of the project itself and how much it will bank for my project and how much it will make for the users of that. That is a more onerous project to, uh, to develop from a financial perspective. It will take more time and effort and resource to be able to make sure that the uh, that the lender is going to get paid back properly, but it is done on many different projects, particularly for the combined heat and power. One of the things you need to pay attention to as well is on the construction loan side of the uh, project, and that is probably one of the most riskiest parts of that, that loan process in that you're not generating any revenue from it, but yet you're spending quite a bit of money. So the lender is going to be putting that money out there and needs to make sure that the project has a method of getting completed. And then once you get the, uh, the project substantially completed, the project can be converted over into a long-term loan, usually with lower rate structures, and it makes it a lot easier once you start generating revenue to be paying for these systems. So who's involved with the financial parts of it? There's a lot of different pieces. And what we're trying to understand is how, what the lender is going to find, try to find out is how is it structured? So who is the operator of that system and how are they going to be connected to the project owner? Sometimes it may be the same company. They're one in the same group. And it makes it a lot easier than having these legal entity agreements between all these folks. So how am I going to be using that energy? Do I sell it to the grid? Do I use it internally? All of these things need to be known and understand by the financing company, and they need to have a firm understanding of how this is going to happen, and they have to have um, a good feeling that it's, in fact, going to be – they're going to get paid over the course of this time. Typically, these contracts will last between a year and two years longer than what the financial time commitment is, so that there's some time to be working on the loan as, as need be. We're also going to be looking for uh, different people to be allocating risk to. So the operational risk, obviously, would go to someone like an operator. Uh, the credit risk, the lender is going to be taken care of. Construction risk is going to need to be um, shored up by the general contractor. Storm and fire and, and other risk insurance um, by insurance companies that do those types of things for a living and know how to back these projects. And, of course, the gas supply could be from uh, the gas supplier, uh, somebody who's going to be on a note to be able to provide that energy to the system. But these risks need to be understood to be able to get a good finance uh, project together. And once you get these together, you can end up with some very good projects that will offer you a lot of hours. Uh, for example, this uh, Snowbird Resort has over 200,000 hours of operation with the three generator sets that have been there for quite some time in combined heat and power service. In fact, there is no u electric utility service connected to that facility. It is 100% operated by, uh, by power generation. Power generation in many different utility applications, in commercial applications, in high-rise buildings, we see these on a regular basis, and I, we're seeing a lot more interest in these as the price of gas remains relatively low, the pressure on electric prices to keep increasing continues, 
and we see a number of users trying to find ways to basically control their destiny by controlling their energy costs for their projects. With that, I will turn it back to Nick. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. Uh, wow, we had a lot of questions coming from the audience, um, and what I'd like to do now is go ahead and go through some in, in real time here live, and um, also encourage you to stick around uh, right up until the end. we got a couple poll questions before we have you depart. But um, the first question I have here is really, I think, geared uh, towards Ray on the diesel side. Um, Ray, is it accurate, and this is coming from Ben Dreyer of HDR, is it accurate that a Tier 4 certified package um, that has the SCR um, after treatment interlocked to the engine, meaning if the SCR system is failing and we lose urea injection, are we shutting down Tier 4 engines in that instance? Yes, and, and <clears throat> what you're getting at there is with regards to a, a – a phrase called inducement, uh, and that is to say that by the EPA requirements, essentially, if the system is falling outside of what they deem as compliance, uh, then all manufacturers' products of a certified product uh, have to begin uh, this inducement process by which the product will shut down. Now, there are uh, various levels of this transition process, so if you have an alarm on the first time, uh, you will have several hours to remedy the problem before the unit is forced to shut down, and then that subsequently gets a little bit tighter uh, from a window standpoint. Thanks, Ray. Uh, another question here I have from Dave Kimmy of Intercon. Um, he's surprised to see the higher installed costs per kilowatt for a gas gen set versus a diesel. He's asking the question, what are the advantages of a multi-fuel, say, I guess, gas and diesel, uh, configuration, and I don't know if this is Ray or this is Mike, but feel free to jump in, guys. Uh, I think I can answer it two ways. One is uh, if you're talking about multi-fuel in terms of having both a gas and diesel on site, obviously the benefits are you have you have power, and, and assuming you're having redundancy built in with both of those systems. Um, if he's talking multi-fuel in terms of bi-fuel systems, uh, well, then you have the benefits of gas blending in terms of lower fuel costs. However, there are some complexities in terms of uh, recertifying in the EPA's eyes on site with those products, um, as well as if you happen to be, let's say, in uh, an area of California during an outage, uh, they tend to shut off the gas initially when that happens anyway. So, Thanks, Ray. Um, this is a question for Mike Devine. Mike, um, William Pauls from Duke is asking, with regard to CHP, what do you think of the concept proposed by ACEEE that electric utilities should own these CHP assets? I think uh, one of the bigger issues that electric utilities have had over the years is not being able to control when a CHP unit is online, and it takes up their base load capability. So uh, utilities, as a rule, don't seem to care whether you have a CHP system online during their peaking periods, but they very much do care if you're going into their base load period, and they still have to get rid of and generate base load energy. They can't just shut a coal-fired unit down. So I think that the what we're seeing is a lot of utilities will start to look at some of these CHP projects and be starting to uh, actually either own or have in their rate structures a method to be able to control when it comes on. And as long as the system is beneficial to both the utility and to the user, I think they can both win. The utility gets uh, some additional peaking capability, and the user gets uh, the advantages of the lower rate. They're able to use the combined heat and power asset, if that's the case, or just distributed asset. And they also have a standby asset to be able to use in case of a power outage. So I think it can be a win-win in both situations. Thanks, Mike. Uh, got a question here on the rental side uh, for Joe Fiorito. Joe, what types of electrical connections can I expect on uh, a temporary rental gen uh, generator? Rick Copeland from Crenshaw Consulting is asking, you know, is it just the cam locks that, that we heard about earlier, or what can be expected? And, Joe, you may need to unmute yourself. Depending on the size of the generator set uh, being supplied, it can either come standard with a cam lock receptacle right in the back plane of the generator set, or it would come with a blank bus bar. 
uh, typical half-inch bolts. I can't remember the spacing on them, but sufficient to get enough leads in there per phase. Uh, many applications you'll see uh, dealers, dealerships will attach what they call tails to the bus bar. So it eliminates one of the steps on job sites so that when you do roll out the generator set to the site, it's just a matter of the twist lock, cam lock style connections from the generator set to the, uh, you know, the various lengths of the cable. Thanks, Joe. Um, I have a question coming here asking about biofuel systems. Actually, a few questions about biofuel systems. Um, what is CAP's position on some of these, you know, either retrofit or uh, from the factory dual fuel systems that are being uh, made available in the marketplace these days? Yeah, I can answer that one, Nick. Uh, <clears throat> we have plenty of experience with these uh, in the marketplace in, in, with regards to the third-party solutions. Um, and uh, we support it if a, if a customer has a requirement and, and wants to extend their runtime. Uh, as I mentioned before, though, there's just a bit of a complexity in terms of making sure you work uh, with the folks who are working your air permit uh, to make sure you go through the proper processes to, to revalidate the certification on that Genset product. Thanks, Ray. Um, here's a question, Mike, about spark spread and the difference in gas and electricity prices in North America today. Uh, and this question is from Craig Prisgoda of uh, Momento. At what spark spread do CHP systems become aboard, uh, affordable? I wish I had a, something that I could just tell you the answer was seven and the answer would be done. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, some of it depends on, on the nature of where that price is. So if I have a high electric price, relatively speaking, so if I'm at 12 or, um, or 15 cents a kilowatt hour, um, uh, then it, the gas price can be quite a bit higher and the spread can be, it would need to be um, actually shorter to be able to cover that need. Whereas if I'm at uh, six cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, I made to have a, have to have a wider spread in terms of a percentage in order to be able to cover the cost differential between the two. Uh, the other side of it also is the cost of the equipment and the operating efficiencies of the e equipment. So if I have just a generator set that's running at 35% uh, electrical efficiency, if I have one that's running 45% electrical efficiency, that's obviously going to have a huge impact on that. So I wish I could say there was a number. It would sure make our life a lot easier. But uh, unfortunately, it's one of those things where you almost have to calculate it out on a per-unit basis uh, to get it close. But it's usually not that hard as long as you know what the, uh, what the fuel costs are and then for both the, um, for the gas as well as your electric rate structure costs and then your total operating costs, you know, owning and operating costs on a cents per kilowatt hour basis. You can usually get a pretty good feel for it fairly quickly. Um, Mike, I'll do maybe one or two more questions. We've got a lot coming in on this topic. So um, Eric Cayouette from Amera is asking, uh, you mentioned steam and steam generation off of a generator. Is CAT able to provide steam generators? Um, we have provided generators on site. We do not manufacture steam generators ourselves, and I assume you're talking about recovering heat, taking the steam, and then generating electric power with that. Um, we have used them on a number of projects throughout the world. Uh, usually on the larger projects, it's usually not very cost effective until you get at least into the 10 megawatt and higher range, uh, usually quite a bit more than that. But, um, but we have done those projects before, but we do not manufacture those products specifically ourselves. And Mike, um, Matthew Stoanji from HS Angus Consulting is asking about electrical load and heat output. Is there a relationship or does the amount of connected electrical load to a generator affect how much heat it's producing? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, the higher the load that you have on the engine, the more fuel it's going to take to cover that load. The more fuel is being consumed in the engine, the more uh, heat is going to be made available as a result of that. Now, in a gaseous fueled engine, cut different than what a diesel would be, the temperature of that heat, even on a, if I had a 50% load and I had a 100% load uh, on the engine, the temperature of the exhaust gases and the jacket water will be basically the same or very similar. 
because of the air fuel ratio that's going into that. You have a constant air and constant fuel that's going into there. So the temperature will be similar, but the volume of that heat will be quite a bit different between the different loads, as opposed to a diesel engine to take heat recovery where you have an air you don't have an air fuel ratio you're concerned about. You have an overabundance of air, and you put enough fuel in there to be able to make the heat load that you need to generate the power. So there, the temperature of that exhaust, uh, the exhaust gas will change pretty readily as well, the jack of water being fairly similar all the time. Thanks, Mike. And um, I see we're at the end of our time. And what I'd like to do is ask everyone to please help with just two poll questions, and we'll let you go. I promise if you ask a question that we didn't address, we'll follow up with you via email after the event here. But first off, um, based on what you heard today, were you previously aware that Caterpillar offered um, the different products and services that you heard about today? Were you totally unaware, maybe only had a little information, um, or completely uh, previously aware before you came to this event? This is really helpful for us to, to know. If you could please go ahead and uh, submit your answer to that question. And um, I got one more for you as well. Uh, tell us how we did today, if you would, please. How would you rate the information provided today uh, on a scale between anywhere from excellent to poor? Uh, this is really helpful to us to be able to improve the next time we do this. Uh, this is our sixth webcast, and we anticipate to continue to do more, and hopefully you're getting the value out of it that we hope you are. So. Um, on behalf of all of our participants from Caterpillar here today, I just want to thank everybody who participated and uh, dialed into the webcast today. I um, want to thank our speakers, uh, Mike, Joe, and uh, Ray, for uh, participating as well today. And we'll look for you at our next one. Thanks much. Goodbye.